Hello, beautiful people. Welcome to Talking Treats. This is a podcast brought to you by the Treats team, where we explore people's passions. We discuss the struggles of having a passion with different guests from around the world in order to learn the best ways to enjoy, learn, and ultimately grow from our passions. Today, I'm joined by Dimitri and by Jess, who will be co-hosting today with me in this very special episode of Talking Treats. Today's guest is a professional tennis player from Germany, who was actually born in Moscow into one of the most known and successful tennis families, arguably of all time. He has an impressive career, having reached 25th in world ATP ranking and has represented his country in global tournaments. Not only is he an incredible athlete, but his generous involvement in charity work, and most recently, the world of NFTs has brought him to us at Treats. It's a huge honor for us to be talking to him today. So without further ado, let's talk to Misha Zverev. Hello, Misha. How are you doing? Hello, guys. That was a nice introduction. I felt really, <laughs> I felt special for a moment. I was like, ooh, that, that didn't, you make it sound really good. So thank you for that. Um, Do you not normally I, feel special? <laughs> uh, well, thanks for having me. I mean, normally, um, you know, I, I normally hear like, spe- well, you know, talks about like Roger Federer, my brother. So um, to me, they're really special. They're unique. They're great athletes and ambassadors of the sport and just, you know, great human beings. So but I'm glad I can, you know, be a part of what we're trying to do. And, and it's, and thank you for having me. First of all, it's, it's an honor and um, I hope we can, we can go a long way together. You're very welcome. It's actually funny. I mean, that you talk about the world of tennis, um, but really what brought you to treats is not the world of tennis. It's kind of what you do outside of the court um, and your recent, you know, activities that you wanted to get involved with. I mentioned as well, charity work and NFT, like what, uh, what inspired you to to reach this conclusion that you wanted to embark in this journey? Well, you know, uh, I have a friend, Sh- Shanka. He's also my my partner, b- business partner, and good friend. So we always try to you know walk through life with open eyes to see wh- what's out there. You know, like whether it's people, opportunities, like n- new things that pop up. Like um, you know, a few years back, it was uh, you know social media really boomed and then the, the cryptocurrencies and now like all this digital world is is really growing and you can find so many new sectors in that particular branch that like are very interesting and we thought you know like we, we came across nfts and we thought like look this is great this is awesome and this is also maybe a good way to to try to do something good you know to use it for for a good cause and um since it's all kind of new and it's more like an experiment, um, I definitely wanted to try to, you know, board this journey, but try to do it for, for some, for, like I said, for a good cause and um, try to help people. And um, here we are right now. Uh, so far, it, it's everything is so new to me. I'm learning myself like every day, like about NFTs, about the token world, about like cryptocurrency, about just in general, like all the different opportunities that are out there. But it's very, very interesting so far. I mean, it's crazy that before we would buy, you know, pieces of art to hang on our walls. Now we have art to keep on our phones. I mean, it totally makes sense, right? We spend more time looking at our phones than we spend looking at the walls. So (laughs) it's... uh, It's also, it's a unique way to connect people, to connect communities and countries and and cultures. And uh, because people ask me, like, you know, you were born in Russia, raised in Germany, you spent a lot of time in the US, you live in Monaco, like, do you feel one way or the other? And I feel like I feel very international because we all like we're on the same planet. Yes, mm-hmm. we we were born in different countries, but in the end, we're not all that different. And I think uh, it's it's what unites us and what makes us unique. But still, I feel like we're one big family, like, you know, trying to uh, go on this journey called life. And um, yeah, we should, you know, we're on this planet all together. We should try to like help each other to preserve it and do the best we can to be uh, good passengers. For sure. We're all as unique as uh, an NFT. <laughs> <laughs> True. Yeah. Um, yeah. There is, well, my NFT, there's, there's five pieces. So uh, it is unique in a way, but there's, you know, five pieces of it. They're collectibles. And um, we thought it's a good way to start uh, not to make too many, not too little and just, you know, see how, what reaction we will get from different people, you know, that, that see it or try to, you know, purchase it in an auction. It's, like I said, it's all a journey. Namaste, honestly. Yeah, well, <laughs> I guess so. I, I'm not much into yoga, but uh, <laughs> that works out. Yeah, um, so just as you said, you know, it's the same for us at, at Treats. We, we all have our different passions 
And, um, you know, it can be music for Carlos, for example, it can be dance, it can be sport, it can be uh, cooking for myself. Um, but sometimes passions are our jobs and, and, and jobs and passions can request a lot of time and, and, and dedication. Um, I just wanted to, to, to know what does it take to turn a passion into a job? What does it take? Well, it, it takes a little bit of luck for sure, but it also takes a lot of um, determination and work. I don't want to say work because you, everybody works. Everybody tries to do their best, but um, sometimes you also need to be lucky, you know, like you need to be in the right circumstances. There's a lot of people that, that have a passion, that, that have a goal, but they have such a hard time getting there because of circumstances that are really out of their control. So I'm, I'm blessed that I had the chance to, you know, fall in love with, with my passion, which is tennis and, and be able to, you know, play tennis and practice and try to become the best I can um, in the world by, by training with great people, my parents and my coaches, you know, so I was very fortunate yeah. with that. And um, like I said, we, we need to be lucky and we need to, you know, help others that are less fortunate. And because we're all on the same planet, we try to like, you know, make the best we can out of it. So but to me, it was um, what really got me to the point where I wanted to become a professional tennis player was also the fact that my parents were, were athletes, they were great tennis players. So growing up as a little kid, you want to be, you know, you have your idols are your parents. You want to be like your dad. You want to be like your mom. And mm -hmm. I saw them, you know, spending a lot of hours on the court and, and playing tennis and traveling to tournaments, playing in competition. So that really inspired me. And up until, you know, up to this day, like I, my favorite memories were when I watched my dad play in, you know, little league matches or smaller tournaments, because, you know, by the time I was born, he had already quit tennis professionally, but he was still playing like regionally. So those were my like biggest inspirations. And that really boosted, you know, the love towards tennis. And um, I think also, you know, looking at my brother, who's now world number six um, in the ATP rankings, he grew up I guess watching my parents watching me and like he was introduced to this beautiful world of sports so you know it's kind of like you you pass it on to the next generation now I have a little son and uh, my goal is to to be able to compete in a big event on a big court and like in front of his eyes I think that would be that would mean a lot to me yeah yeah absolutely I can see now a lot of different players that are um you know changed by having a kid as well is like amazing uh I think it's really nice to see uh, for us fans as well like it's really important I think also um, I, I always say look as much as you love tennis tennis can only love you back so much you know like exactly a human being like a human connection it's that's what really drives us that's what's really special so exactly I love tennis but like you know watching my son watch me or enjoy the same sport that I do that like that's a whole nother level of, of emotions and and just, I mean, that's really, that's unbeatable. Yeah. And so I'm glad you're talking about uh, tennis, you know, and, and, and being a, as well a, a job. Is, is it, I mean, I'm a, I'm a tennis player myself. I'm a, I'm a tennis fan. And mm -hmm. for me, tennis has always been a game. It's fun. And I love tennis. And, uh, but you made tennis your profession yeah so um, is it you know is it is it still a game for you are you is it difficult uh, uh to enjoy your passion when you're actually making a living out of tennis of, out of a sport um i love it's a game when you're on the court but before you get to the court you spend a lot of hours in the gym on the treadmill running around like you know doing all kinds of exercises preparing training and sometimes that can be like like a job you know you do things that are maybe less fun sometimes or you do right. things that you don't want to really do today but that's part of your job but because you love the game you know which you're aiming towards then it all that just it becomes a little bit easier you know mm -hmm. because once you're on the court and you have the racket in your hand and like you play you know you, you feel the tennis ball you play you like you try different shots it's, it, you, you feel like a little kid, you know, like I'm now 33, year old, 33 years old. Roger Federer is, is 39 yeah. as far as I know. And um, <laughs> when we 
get when we step onto a tennis court, we all become little kids. Like we, we just have a racket and a tennis ball and we're all the same. We're all equal. And we, we, we all enjoy it no matter how old we are, young or old. So um, I think that's also what unites us because age is nothing but a number once you're on a tennis court, you know, like it's just one guy against another guy playing, playing a game. And um, that's fantastic. It's phenomenal. I think that's what we all love about this sport. Yeah, it's amazing. Amazing to hear you saying that because because we love tennis, yeah. you know, and it's all that matters. Um, and so again, um, with with treats, um, we we like to inspire people, as I think uh, as you do. And um, I, because of my job, you know, I, I sometimes get asked a certain questions which I think can be a lot, can mean a lot to, to, to people, to young people, especially, um, which is um, what advice would you give to someone who would like to, to pursue a career in not especially tennis, that's, but uh, in his or her passion? Maybe you should explain, Dimitri, what what your job is to give uh, Misha context I, because it's not a typical job. <laughs> absolutely, no, no, no. I am I am a chef. I am a chef, uh, chef slash pastry chef slash baker slash um, chocolatier. Um, I love, so I love food and I love desserts. Okay, <laughs> so cool. Well, come back you're tomorrow, in the right place. Please, like we, yeah, need, because this is this absolutely. is also my passion. I love every time. So this is a nice thing about traveling. Every time I go to a different country or place. I just look up the like hole in the walls restaurants, local foods. Yeah. And this is what I really love and especially wow. desserts. So I have a sweet tooth. That's, um, that's my. Okay, yeah. cool. Well, we, we have a lot, a lot to share then. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, um, it's just sad now that I'm in London and that the, uh, the ATP finals aren't in London anymore. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just, my my job can be can be tough you know it's not it's not all, all about uh master chef and top chef you know yeah. um it can be it can be sometimes hard it's an amazing amazing job because it's every day it's different uh you meet incredible people you work with incredible people um and you make something great you know like something yeah. that people uh, enjoy um so that's you know so that's also why i wanted to to um to ask you uh so yeah back to your question what what advice so you know i i guess before you try to you know get to the passion topic i always say there's like so many other steps that that come first you know first of all you need to get to know yourself if, if you know yourself, if you understand yourself, you will know what your true passion is. Because sometimes we live in a world with, you know, social media has a lot of influence on a human being, like the people outside, like they have a lot of opinions that sometimes they try to project on you. So a lot of people grew up thinking that their passion is one thing, but then, you know, deep down, they like, they don't really know themselves. So my, my first advice to every young person, every person, doesn't matter what age, is like to, you know, to be true to yourself and to understand yourself and to understand the people around you that are closest to you, which is family. And only understanding where, where you came from, so your roots, you will understand yourself and you will be able to, you know, predict the future or, or, or see what will really interest you in life. And I think this is the first step towards, you know, account, like reaching the goal of like making your passion your job or or you know understanding what your passion is so it's um i guess until you you've done the first one two three steps um you can't really reach the the fourth one which is you know passion so i believe that if you just go through life with with your senses wide open and, and you see people you hear people you feel everything that's happening around you um you'll get a good understanding of, of who you really are and then finding your passion and, and trying to, you know, reach that goal, it'll be more natural, you know, it, it'll, it'll be like a smooth transition. So it's not like a, you know, one big jump, you know, like a one big change. It's, it's a, you know, I always say like make, like you, we come across like different 
questions every day, like where we need to make a decision. So I say like, always try to be honest to yourself and take the right decision, uh, you know, give the right answer. And that'll lead you to a bigger task, a bigger uh, question or decision-making point. And then that's when you will finally, you know, maybe at age 20, 25, 30, you'll get to the point where you can say like, yeah, like this is my passion. I've, I've accomplished what, what I wanted to do and I'm here. Mm -hmm. But um, it's not, it, that's not going to happen from today to tomorrow. There's a lot of work in the sense of getting to know each other. I think to know yourself. And I think um, this is very important in life that today people spend a lot of time trying to understand others, trying to understand what's really trendy today, what's cool, what's not cool. Like, oh, tomorrow I have to wear, you know, next summer I have to wear orange because that's going to be trendy. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not too worried about all that because life is not that simple that the media will tell you what you have to do, what you have to wear and what you have to like. So I think today's world is, is everything is happening so fast that something that's nice to, you know, slow it down a little bit, you know, to pause for a second, you know, to close your eyes and to really feel like who you are and then like what's going on, who do you love, like what's important to you. And then the path I think forward will be a lot clearer and easier to take that's that's my approach i guess yeah i mean actually speaking about these knowing yourself moments yeah. um i mean from the history of your career it's actually you can see that back in you know 2015 where you had that slump all the way down to almost a thousand atp ranking and then coming back almost seemingly miraculously right all the way yeah. back to the top 30 everyone knows that that wasn't miraculous and that that was a challenge of knowing yourself right and and uh hard work so you know what what were the factors that helped you to push through that was it really a deep knowing of yourself and i mean what are the strategies that you took yeah so my career um i climbed to 45 in the world um by the time I was 21, 22. So I think that was, that was pretty good back in the day. Um, that was in 2009, but, um, you know, I, I felt like playing tennis and being on tour was, was not everything, you know, there's, there's more to life, not in the sense like I need to, you know, quit tennis and like go to a deserted Island and just spend three months, <laughs> yeah. like meditating or reading a book or writing a book, you know, it yeah. was, no, it was, it was just different things. It was like, like what I just, I was, I was talking about. So, um, I, I focused on tennis, I played tennis, but I also focused on other things. And I was like getting to know myself and understanding myself. And, and, and it was very important to me to have relationships with people around me to like really uh, take them seriously. So I guess maybe that's why a little, some focus was taken away from tennis and my ranking dropped and I was, um, I spent a year or two not in the top hundred. Um, then what happens is I got injured a few times. And then in 2014, I had surgery on my wrist, on my playing arm. And um, that was the moment when I didn't even have an option to go on the court. Like, even if I wanted to, I couldn't do it. And I think when something that you love, but you don't know that you love it, is taken away from you, that's when you realize how much you miss it and how, how, much, like, how much you love this game. And um, so after surgery, I had a cast on my, on my playing on for a few months. Uh, I, but I kept traveling around the world with my brother at that time, supporting him and then trying to help him just, you know, as a brother. Uh, so I, I stayed true to the game. And I realized that I think I want to give it a shot because I, I wasn't sure if I was going to make it again to the top 100 or whatever. And I didn't care so much about it because it was my goal was not to like reach a certain ranking. My goal was to get back out there and do the best I can to really now focus 100% on what I love, but now as a different human being in the sense of like I, me as a person, I felt I was more complete. You know, mm -hmm. I, I didn't have so many questions in my head about like all kinds of different things. I was very determined and focused. And I didn't doubt myself and I didn't question myself whether I had something to do with tennis or my personal life. And um, that's when my real journey be began on the tennis court, you know? And yeah, starting from 2014, my ranking was like, or in 2015, my ranking was like 1100. I worked my way up and I had to play qualities in every tournament. So I was never in the main room every week. I had to play qualities, qualities, qualities. And um, I actually broke the record for- yeah. 
um, qualifying the most times in the year in 2015 yeah. and 16. And um, 2015, it was nine times. And in 2016, I think it was 10 times. And that was the all time record for most qualified in a year for, for a player. Um, but I didn't mind it again. It was like, again, it was like taking some extra steps to get to the manger. But to me, it was all worth it. I didn't worry so much about it. People were asking me like, aren't you tired to play qualities again? Because people, if people don't know when you play qualities, you don't really earn much money and you don't really earn any points. So you kind of play for free for nothing. And then once you get to the main draw, that's when you get rewarded with points, with money and all the, you know, perks and, and, and all the benefits. So but I didn't mind it because I was just enjoying the whole process and it was so nice. It was so good. And um, yeah, it, it was phenomenal. It was, like I said, it was a lot of work, but it, yeah. was just, it, was, it was a lot of fun. I guess it wasn't so much like a mental or a physical obstacle, but rather like an attitude change where you really started to actually return to the passion originally. It, it maybe started to become a job. And then when you faced it again as a privilege to be playing the game as a fun thing to be doing and you know it, it was completely demonstrated by how you acted you know playing qualifying rounds it's like okay well i'm enjoying it it's not for the uh, getting the yeah. ranking level it's not about that and yeah, yeah it was, that's good advice i was i was a different person because um when when you do something something also when you do something for many years and you kind of get used to it it becomes just like it's just what you do you know you wake up in the morning you just do it because you've been doing it for so long so to me the time off from the court like it made me realize like i i i don't want to say i fixed everything else but i i understood myself i understood the world and like i'm like okay now i feel good now i can focus on tennis and it's and i'm a different human being it was just i was i i realized and i saw tennis with completely different eyes so it was it was really really interesting yeah so apart from, I mean, we're talking about tennis quite a bit, but I mean, in your day-to-day -day life outside of the court, are there any lessons that you've learned that you've seen applied in that day-to-day, -day? even if it's, you know, cooking or uh, whatever it is, playing with your kids? Is there something that's maybe a bit more practical that you've seen yourself do? Oh, I didn't even realize I, I knew this, but it's because of the tennis that um, I learned about that. Tennis, I guess... It's a little bit like you train, like let's say in August, you have a big tournament. So you spend uh, June, July training, preparing. And uh, what you've learned, like training and preparing, even if it doesn't always go well, and even if it doesn't go smoothly, mm. in the end, it gives you something. It gives you confidence. It gives you faith, belief, whatever it is. But then it pays off in the sense of like, y you feel satisfied with the result. And and that's always nice. It goes back to actually, I think life taught me about tennis, you know, like taking the right decisions in life and on the court helps my tennis mm -hmm. and vice versa. So also, you know, what I tell my, like when I'm with my kid, when we play a game, I never, we never make it about winning. So like he's, my son's two and a half years and we never count scores or anything. Like we, we just try to do something and try to do it better. Like next time, or like we, we exchange ideas. Like when we play soccer, he's like, he's showing me different ways how to kick the ball. And I show him different ways. And like, when we fail, we fail together. We laugh about it. It's okay. So I never make it about like, you know, black and white as in like success and failure, because that's just, it's all relative, you know, like one thing might look like a failure, but you know, honestly, maybe it's, a, it's the biggest success of your career. You know, it, it all, it's all depends on how you look at things. So the perspective of, of life in life and tennis is very important. And um, so the lessons were taught and learned from, you know, both, both sides. Would you say that, um, since we're talking about lessons, would you say that also some of the lessons that you learned um, come also from like different aspirations that you also have outside of the court? I know we were talking about, um, the Dimitri's baking, so um, maybe f f food and uh, and um, yeah, croissants are, are one of your uh, many aspirations. What would you say? Yeah, do you have any other aspirations besides tennis? Um, what you mean my passion? What else I love? Uh, yeah. Well, I love aviation, so flying airplanes is is I guess my second biggest passion. So. 
I always say, you know, like the, the day I quit tennis professionally, I'm going to buy myself an airplane and fly around the world. So oh. um, this is something else I, I, I truly love and I'm fascinated about. And um, so like I want to take my son to the tennis game, I also took him flying. So we, we spend a couple of times like just him and I sitting in, in a little airplane flying around town and like going from one airport to the other. And like me teaching about the, you know, aerodynamics of, you know, how what makes an airplane fly how to control it so those things are i'm just fascinated with, you know like because you see the world from from a different again perspective you look look down onto it but like it's so calm and quiet and everything's kind of moving quickly but also slowly at the same time and this is something i really enjoy because um when we're down on, on the ground like we go to the grocery store we go to the movies to the restaurant like we're like little ants like working and going from a to b so fast non-stop but when I'm up in the air, I see everything in slow motion. You know, the cars are driving, people are walking and like, but still it's happening so slowly. And, and I can go from A to B seeing so many more things. Like suddenly, like I like to fly in Florida. So you see like the Everglades, like the, the, the swamps and like the, the, you know, the wetlands. And then you fly up north, suddenly like the green greenery changes. Like there's like hills and mountains. You go further up north, like, the world starts changing and, and that's something that I love to observe and, and I think it's very interesting. So like I said, one day I, I want to fly around the world in a little airplane and just see how there's so many different cultures and communities, but um, yeah, just experience it. It's so interesting that you say that. Um, my father's actually an aviation passionate. Uh, he's a dentist, but his hobby is to do, oh, really? you know, yeah, flight simulator. Um, and it, it, his, he would love if he could spend, you know, the eight hours a day that he's working on a plane. And I think really it is, it's a kind of a form of active meditation yes. where it's such a complex thing that you're doing, um, that you get to zone out somehow. It seems a little bad to think of a pilot <laughs> like zoning out or meditating when they should be flying the plane. But I definitely think that there's a, there's a kind of brain balance that occurs when you're doing something that's so complex and so kind of insane to your brain that you rest yes um it's it's weird that you say that because that's exactly what i feel when i'm up there um i know people don't belong up there it's dangerous you can crash you can you know fall you can die um it's not a place where that's that's for humans normally it's for birds and you know all that stuff so but when i'm up there i understand i'm aware that it's dangerous that's why i focus but my focus is different than the focus i experience when i play tennis or exercise or work out or even talk to people i i try to feel the surroundings so like when i'm flying the airplane i i not only hear the engine i feel the engine so if there's a change of rpm the engine becomes slower before i hear it i feel it and then like when i start banking i you know normally you do like a whatever 15 degree bank you look at the instruments to make sure it's 15 degrees, but when you fly, you, you just feel it at some point. You just feel the airplane moving left and right, accelerating, decelerating, you know, descending and, and gaining altitude. So all those things, like, I feel like all my senses are working, but at the same time, relaxing. So everything that I can't feel on the ground while hitting tennis balls, I get to experience up there. So I feel like it's a good method to just balance it out and, um, do something insanely crazy but try to make it as safe as possible and uh yeah like i said just also your eyes you see the world completely like with different eyes and that's so unique wow that's that's, that's really interesting in in uh in in treats we actually really believe that uh that uh, practicing a passion of yours whether it's a primary passion or whether it's a secondary passion let's say that it really helps you in day-to-day -day life like just to to focus better to 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 feel to feel better just in general and and uh from what you're saying i really yeah i really i really feel that that you feel that it's uh it's very important to you yeah i also say look if if you want to make me happy just uh buy me a little piece of land with a little cottage and just a landing strip and then i'll get a little airplane uh maybe i'll build, build it myself and then all i would do is just fly around and just th that would just make me happy that's uh and also the fact that i'm looking forward to those moments they also just make me wake up every morning with a smile on my face you know like looking forward to you know hitting tennis balls or looking forward to spending time with my family looking forward to flying and then like experiencing like aviation 
those things make me really happy. And, and even mm. when, you know, the weather is not nice and, you know, sometimes you go through rough patches in life, those things like they can pick you back up and, you know, they put a smile on your face. And that's also very important to, to have a passion because that drives you and then that motivates you and that helps you to get through the tough uh, patches in your life. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. It's yeah. Really amazing. Um, okay. So I'd like to finish this very interesting interview uh, podcast and by playing a little game that we call this or that. This or that? This or that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So first question, singles or doubles? Mm, oh, tough one. Uh, let's go doubles. Okay. Okay. Second one is going to be a bit, I think, tougher. <laughs> okay. Um, Lovic, which is um, the official Zverev cheerleader, is your, yeah. your dog, um, or your brother? My brother. <laughs> okay. <laughs> nice one. Nice one. Um, Eye of the Tiger by Survivor, or I'm Still Standing by Elton John. Oh, I didn't tell you guys. I'm not much into music. So oh. I, I honestly, neither one, just give me the sounds of rain or thunderstorms or birds and that, that will make it. That's even even, even more interesting yeah. uh, uh, answer. That's amazing. <laughs> Do you listen to anything before matches or something like that? I mean, I know it's yeah. very typical for football players. And for not a lot. Athletes. So music, sometimes I, I could listen to a song or two if I really want to. But I'm not someone who can listen to music like while studying or working. So I don't like mm -hmm. background noise. Yeah. Because yeah. I, even if I'm not aware of it, I feel like my body reacts to everything that's happening. Yeah. So same the more me. there is happening, the more subconsciously I will react to it, or you know, I'll absorb absorb it. So that's why I like to keep my space around me clean, clean and controlled. So um, that's why, yeah, no music before matches, like natural sounds, yes. Like the wind, the ocean, birds, rain, all that is good. Everything artificially made, not, not yet, maybe soon. Would you say that um, when, you're, when you're playing at a, uh, dur during a match that you, you know, you like it when it's completely silent and when the, the crowd is very, yeah, just very silent or would you, do you get like, you know, yeah just a bit unfocused um, um to be honest i i never look into the stands so sometimes if i would fit, go walk, walk off a court and people would ask me were there a lot of people watching you i would say i have no idea if you tell me <laughs> the stadium was full or half full i'm like okay like I, i trust you but i have no clue so when you play a match i wouldn't be able to tell you if the crowd is being loud or quiet because i'm so much in my zone like in my you know, tunnel vision that mm -hmm. I'm not, I have no idea. So this is, I guess I'm very different because my brother, for example, he loves the crowd. He uses the energy from the crowd to get himself going, to, you know, mm -hmm. pump himself up or to try to break the opponent or anything. But uh, I'm, I guess I'm the complete opposite. So I hope that answers yeah. your questions the best I can. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's amazing. That, that's, that's great that you say that some people some players i know that needs the crowd and maybe you don't so maybe the the covid situation is not that uh impacting your your game with well game is one thing um what i obviously what i don't like to see is what i like to see is like people having a good time so yeah. it's not like i need or don't need the people i want people to enjoy the sport yeah. just the way i do and and if if there is a great match on center court You know, it's nice to be able to do it in front of people so everyone can enjoy it. You know, if, if you're there alone, it's like if, if you're experiencing a nice moment, but you have nobody to share it with, it's kind of sad, you know. So this yeah. is where I feel like it, it's nice to have spectators. We love, Players love spectators because they can share the passion and the moments in that particular moment with somebody. And, and when there's 10,000 people they'll have an unforgettable moment altogether. And I think they'll, you know, also unite them somehow, you know, for forever. So this is, I think, what's very important for us. So for an artist, for a creator, for, for an athlete, for a sportsman, like if you would do all your 
delicious desserts or like pastries, but you wouldn't have anyone to share it with. You would just do it for yourself. And one day I think you wouldn't enjoy it much because yeah. you want to give it to someone that, you know, preferably that you love or for someone that appreciates your, your art. So yeah. I guess we feel the same way. Exactly. That's why we do what we do. Yeah. Um, so last question, food related. <laughs> yeah. Um, sushi or pizza? Sushi. Sushi. I didn't even think about it, huh? Yeah. I love pizza, but <laughs> sushi. I, so sushi is a funny thing. Um, I used to be on a sushi, chocolate milk, watermelon diet. So this was my go-to. Um, so basically, I played the Australian Open. I beat the world number one, Andy Murray, having oh, right. uh, salmon avocado rolls for breakfast with chocolate milk. <laughs> So that's, that's the hard. secret. Okay. <laughs> now we that. know. <laughs> yeah, some of that watermelon like before or afterwards. So um, I can eat sushi for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So <laughs> that's crazy. That's why sushi is the winner. Okay. okay. Well, with that, awesome. with that final tip, guys, uh, <laughs> make sure you change your diet <laughs> <laughs> to, to be the number one. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have left. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening, the audience. Thank you to you, Misha, for spending the time with us. Uh, it was really an honor. And, um, yeah, for the rest of you out there, hope you have a beautiful day. And, yeah, I don't know if you have any final thoughts. Me personally, well, first of all, thank you for having me. Thank you for, you know, listening to, you know, the things I have to say because it makes me feel it's nice to share thoughts and experience and, and, and memories with people. So, and uh, I always like to say to people, like, in the end, if, if you stay, like, true to yourself, if you're honest to yourself, and then you walk through life with a good heart, then um, everyone, you're going to enjoy life and everyone else is going to enjoy it with you all together. And I think that's, that's the most important. For sure. All right, guys. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so thank much, you, Misha. Thank you, Misha. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.